This content is brought to you by Uphold, which makes crypto investing easy. I've been a user of Uphold since 2017. They're one of my go-to exchanges. You can buy, sell, and trade cryptocurrencies on Uphold. You can also trade precious metals and equities. They have 10 plus million users, 250 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. As with all exchanges, you can buy and sell on them, but I highly recommend you custody your own crypto, not your keys, not your coins. If you'd like to learn more about Uphold, please visit the link in the description. Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Cody Carbone, who is the Vice President of Policy at the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Cody, great to have you on the show. Tony, thanks so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, Cody. So I, I know I mentioned this before the recording. I've been following your tweets and updates about what's happening in DC as it relates to crypto, and I appreciate your updates. And I figured I, I get you on the show, uh, hopefully as a recurring guest, and you know you can give us. The, the the deets about what's taking yeah. place. There's, there's a lot. Now, since it's your first time on the show, I'd love to get to know you a bit better. Tell us about yourself, where you're from, and where'd you grow up? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks again for having me. So I am from Flemington, New Jersey, another New Jersey native like yourself. Um, I grew up there. Um, I went to school in Syracuse, New York. I spent seven years up there getting my um, undergraduate degree, getting my um, master's in policy and my law degree. And um, yeah, and then I moved down to DC back in, oh man, 2016. How did you end up at the Chamber of Digital Commerce? I was working at Ernst & Young in their government affairs and public policy team. Um, I was there for about six years and we had a blockchain consultancy practice at EY. Mm -hmm. And so I would bring these experts to Capitol Hill to meet with the SEC and the CFTC. And the more and more they came up, the more questions I had. Um, mm. And I found it fascinating. And I was used to going in and talking to members of Congress about, you know, pretty mundane accounting rules and laws. And then I started going in and talking about blockchain and their eyes would light up and they'd be like, what is this? What's Bitcoin? What are digital assets? And I was like, okay, you know, and you know, when I was sitting down over the pandemic, I was like, I'm looking for for something new to do, and that's what's exciting. That's where I could really move the needle in, in policy in DC. So I, I made the jump. Oh, very cool. And what was your first encounter with Bitcoin and crypto, and what was your aha moment? So my first encounter um, was is different than my aha moment. Uh, my first encounter was back in oh man. 2013 um, with Bitcoin. One of my friends um, was doing some like shady sports gambling overseas and he got Bitcoin back um, instead of cash as a payment. I'm like, what the heck is Bitcoin? Um, and so that's the first I ever heard of it. And so I was keeping tabs on it, you know, throughout the years as the price fluctuated. My aha moment, I was reading the age of cryptocurrency um a few years back and it was the story on the bank collapse in cyprus um, which i think happened in like 2011 and how the government went in and seized all deposits um uninsured deposits over a hundred thousand dollars and i was like well that's criminal like there has to be a solution to that and you know i finished and completed that book and got more involved in cryptocurrency and that's when i really saw the, the promise here of this technology Mm, yeah, I mean, a pretty uh, amazing, and and I've heard that story before, even with the gambling yeah. stuff. Uh, I, I actually I know one person who used to, who's a great poker player. Is he used to do like online uh, poker games, and he would get paid in Bitcoin. And yeah. I'm like, dude, why didn't you tell me about this back then? <laughs> I know, and I asked my buddy recently, like once I started at the chamber, like, do you still have those Bitcoin? Uh, please tell me you do. And he's like, man, I sold them all. I didn't know what I had. And I said, oh, oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. um, so let's talk about the initiatives that the chamber is currently working on. Um, obviously, you're in the middle of D.C. And yeah, yeah. we've got we're facing some big headwinds, the crypto industry right now. Lots happening, a lot of enforcement actions, a lot of confusion from regulators. Um, what are some of the initiatives the chamber is currently working on? Yeah, uh, you said it. A lot's happening. Um I'm, I'm trying to find calm in the chaos mm -hmm. um, because it seems like if we were devoted to putting out all of the fires, we would just be burnt out. And so we took a step back at the chamber, like, how can we address all of these market failures, 
the bad headlines, the misconceptions. And we went back to our roots and we're focusing on education. Um, and so we came out recently with an education platform on our website. It's called KYC, Know Your Crypto. Mm. Uh, and we're using that as an entryway to go in and talk to more policymakers to make sure that when they are offering policy solutions to everything that's been happening in this space, they're not just reacting. Um, and they're not reacting to some, you know, again, bad headlines, some negative tones at the top or from the administration. They're reacting from a place of a foundational knowledge that they have built within. So this is focused really on, you know, what a, a fifth grader can understand it, uh, the fundamentals of what is cryptocurrency, what is blockchain, you know, how do I buy a, a token or a coin? Um, how do I open up an account at a certain, you know, platform um, or exchange? So education is really how we're trying to address everything that's going on. Yeah. And, and I think that absolutely makes sense. Um, I love the way you put it rather than trying to put out every fire, you know, go to the decision makers and educate them and let them know what's a fire and what's not a fire. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I, and I love uh, the KYC, know your crypto. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that took some, that, that's our, some bigger brains than mine came up with that here at the chamber. <laughs> um, and can you tell us a bit about, you know, which members of Congress you're working with? I, I probably know some of the names, you know, yeah. the, 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 maybe the Tom Emmers and so forth, but I would love to get an idea of who you're working with. Yeah, you, you said it, you know, there's the champions that I think, um, you know, you know, and a, a lot of your, you know, listeners um, and viewers know Tom Emmer, Patrick McHenry, chairman of the House Financial Services Committee. Um, you've got French Hill, who's leading on the digital assets subcommittee. Um, in the Senate, on the Republican side, you know, we're working more with Tim Scott, who's leading the Senate Banking Committee, but you've got Cynthia Lummis, who, of course, is a champion. Ted Budd, who just went from the House to the Senate, um, is also a, a big champion and proponent of this technology. But there are some names that you probably haven't heard of um, that I think are really important to, to call out. Um, on the Democratic side, Greg Meeks. Um, he's chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He's a longstanding member and ally of Maxine Waters on the House Financial Services Committee. He's from New York City. He's been a big proponent of this technology, specifically on the stablecoin legislation and getting a regulatory framework for stablecoins. Um, Richie Torres, you know, mm -hmm. he's tried to, um, to get into this space more. Darren Soto from Florida, uh, co-chair of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. Mike Flood, a freshman Republican, Aaron Houchin, a freshman Republican, who in that first digital asset subcommittee hearing asked really important and informed questions um, and shown their interest in keeping this technology here in the United States. So we try to work with everyone. Uh, you know, we're nonpartisan. This issue should be nonpartisan. We'll work across the aisle. We'll go into any office that's willing to have us. Um, and so I, I think at this point in time, we probably hit almost every office um, in Washington, D.C. Some have been more favorable uh, to our policy positions, some not so much. Um, but those champions are, are champions for a reason. I think there's more of them out there who just haven't been as vocal. Mm. And I appreciate you um, giving those names because to your point, some of, I, I did not know. So that's really great to hear. And it's also great to hear that, you know, it's both Democrats and Republicans that this um, is a bipartisan um, uh, movement uh, to, for these folks to recognize innovation and technology. Um, but I think the big question is, how do we get more members of Congress to understand this? And maybe it's what you guys are doing, right? The education, and it's just grinding on the ed education front. I think that's a part of it. Um, when we go into a member's office and they don't know what blockchain is, or they've never heard of you know, a Bitcoin or XRP or Ethereum, um, we then start with the basics and we try to communicate what the real world benefits are. Um, having those use cases, showing the utility of this technology, that it's not some shadowy underworld and it's not some fad, but that this is solving uh, for inefficiencies that we have in, in payments or in supply chain management, showing them that we're trying to solve real world problems to move not only the financial services industry forward, but every industry, health, um, transportation, you know, this technology impacts everything. So selling those stories 
And I think if more people tell those stories, how we're solving real world problems, make it make the technology understand for them and make it look like something that they know in the real world. That's how we can really change you know, hearts and minds. For sure. Yeah. And to your point, you got to go beyond uh, the speculation, the price, which you know has been the noise for many years and show the real world application. And, and just recently I was reading a report, I think it was from Bank of America talking about like California, they're going to tokenize vehicle titles on yeah. the Tezos blockchain, you know, things like that. Um, I think more of those stories need need to be put in the forefront. That's that's a perfect example uh, on what they're doing in California, the Tezos blockchain. I think too often and for the past years that this technology has been around, so many developers have gone in and they've talked about the tech. And even when I talk to a developer at the tech and I do this stuff every day, it'll go right over my head and they'll use acronyms and words I don't understand. And they'll talk about coding and, you know, and all these different, you know, new terms that are related to our ecosystem. And that just will go right over a lot of these lawmakers heads. So if we can put the technology into terms they already understand and use examples like what they're doing in California and putting registration titles on the blockchain, that's how we can really make a difference. Mm, for sure. So we have this situation that's happening where multiple government agencies, it almost seems coordinated, are going after different crypto companies and exchanges. Um, just yesterday, CFTC going after Binance. Now, I want to make sure I make the distinction that if there are illegal activities going on and the CFTC and the SEC are doing their jobs, that's fine. But I think we're seeing... Um, enforcement without clarity, without the rules of the road, you know, tell me what the law is. And then if I break that law, then you enforce it. But we're right. seeing just enforcement after enforcement. And one agency, the CFTC is saying one thing and the SEC is saying one thing. It's just mass confusion. You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? And, and the Operation Choke Point 2.0 is it's being called? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with the, the regulatory confusion first. Um, it's a mess. Um, and I it's the nature of the beast, really, the U.S. regulatory system is this complicated Byzantine mess where you've got multiple regulators um, all trying to have their hands in the pot and claim jurisdiction. And when you're starting from that point, it already is confusing. And so if you're an issuer in this space, you don't know who to report to. You don't know what rules to follow. And in the crypto space, we don't have rules, as you've said. Um, and so when you've got the SEC saying one thing, the CFT saying, C saying one thing, you've got the banking regulator saying something else, you've got the states doing something else. You're sitting there and like, this is clarity. Um, I, I don't know where to go. I don't know who to respond to. And if even if I want to follow the rules, I don't know what the rules are. Rulemaking is really hard. I understand that. Um, it takes a long time. You go through the Administrative Procedure Act. You go through the notice and comment rulemaking process. It can take up to a year. Our regulators feel like they don't have the luxury to do that. They feel like their feet are to the fire from the administration, from some of the voices, um, the vocal opponents in Congress that they need to act now. What's the quickest way to do that? Enforcement actions. That doesn't take much power um, or time. Um, to bring an enforcement action. And so it's the easiest way to rule make. It's not the proper way. Um, and so that's where we're in between a rock and a hard place. Our industry is asking for clarity. They're asking to have a seat at the table so they can follow the rules, so they can operate safely and securely and protect their con consumers and investors. No one wants to invest or buy from products that they're afraid, you know, are working illegally or that there are going to be scams. So we need rules. Um, we just haven't gotten there. And I'm I'm hopeful that the SEC, CFTC, and some of the other agencies in this space will prioritize rulemaking in favor of enforcement actions. But it's we haven't seen it today. What do you think would be the catalyst to have Congress wake up and, have, and then there's yeah. urgency and a fire lit under them to, to take action? Is it uh, maybe the Ripple lawsuit, the Grayscale lawsuit that these agencies start, start taking losses um, without going to the details of each. But, you, you know, what, what, what do you think might be the catalyst there? I think that helps. I think judicial opinions um, that are favorable for the industry will definitely be a catalyst for more lawmakers to get their butts in gear 
and to do something. Um, you know, there's a cliche in Washington that you never waste a crisis. Mm-hmm. Well, we've had several crises uh, over the past six months, year, and we still don't have legislation that, that gets us any closer. Um, I think at this point, there are still too many cooks in the kitchen. There are regulators coming in and talking to members of Congress, lobbying for their own piece of the pie, as we talked about earlier. And there's just not consensus that this technology is worthwhile. We're still fighting that battle. Um, I can't believe we're still fighting that battle, but there are still people in the United States Congress and in the Biden administration that's saying, don't do anything, don't regulate this industry because then you legitimize it. And until we get over that hurdle, I don't know how we're gonna get comprehensive legislation. The other thing I'll add is that all of the legislative proposals we've seen to date try to solve all the world's problems in one fell swoop. Um, It's really hard to pass an 80 page bill, really, really hard, especially on these esoteric and nuanced, complicated topics like cryptocurrency. We need to have more singular focused, narrow pieces of legislation. Let's just, we don't need to solve every problem. Let's chip away at it. Um, And eventually we'll get to a place where then we have a regulatory framework and a legal framework that we're comfortable with. Yeah. um, And I can imagine the skeptics, even outside of the government, like your Charlie Mungers and Warren Buffett's, I'm sure they're doing some lobbying as well, right? Because they've been very vitriolic, if you want to, that's a word, against like crypto and and writing op-eds and saying nasty things as well. Totally. Um, And they're not alone. You see some of the the bank CEOs like Jamie Dimon come out against Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, The United States, and rightfully so, is very protective of their um, incumbent financial system and their capital markets. And there are a lot of people who see cryptocurrency and blockchain as a threat to those capital markets, to those traditional financial services, you know, the the bank sector. Um, And they'll do anything they can to protect that threat. And they don't see it as an opportunity to make it more efficient. They don't see it as another option for consumers um, and building consumer choice. Um, And that's that's kind of where we are right now. And so it's unfortunate. um, And I am hopeful that education will get more of those cynics and opponents over to our side where we see it's more favorable. But it takes time. We're still so early. Mm. Um, Let's talk about the SEC Ripple lawsuits. Um, the chamber did file an amicus brief on behalf of Ripple. You know, what are your thoughts on that and what the outcome could be? We could hear from the judge any day now. Uh, what are your thoughts overall? Fingers crossed we hear from the judge any day now. I mean, this thing has just drawn out. Um, we thought it was really important to file an amicus brief um, in this situation. Again, we don't think it's right for the SEC to rule make through um, enforcement action. And that's what they were doing here. Um, I think, you know, Ripple got dealt a bad hand. Um, You know, they had their ICO in what, 2012. They get this um, action from the SEC in 2020 um, after they've been operating for eight years. That's not fair to the company. That's not fair to investors. I think if we had um, Hester Peirce, Commissioner Hester Peirce in the SEC, if we had her token safe harbor proposal that she proposed several years ago now, where tokens can operate in the space, you know, under the oversight of the SEC, and they can work on being sufficiently decentralized, like Ripple and XRP have, you know, have tried to do, that would be an opportunity where we can then forego enforcement actions, we can forego investor harm, and we can get to a place where companies can operate safely in this space and know what their regulatory requirements are. Mm. I'm hopeful well, we see a resolution shortly, um, and um, I'm hoping it's favorable. Mm. And on the other side of the token here, Grayscale is suing the SEC yeah. for a Bitcoin spot ETF, which uh, you know the SEC has approved a futures ETF, a short ETF, but not a spot. Um, what do you think about the outcome of that lawsuit? Very hopeful uh, that it will turn out in Grayscale's favor. And you know, similar to the Ripple case, it's really hard to be, take an agency to court and to win. Um, there's not a lot of examples or precedent for that being done. It can be done though, um, and it has been done. And so I'm hopeful uh, both Grayscale and Ripple um, 
have great arguments. They're well capitalized. They're the ones who are willing to take the fight. In the grayscale case, you know, it, it seems pretty clear to me um, and reading the judge's statements from uh, the last, what was it, early March, uh, the last hearing they had, um, that the SEC's actions to continue to oppose um, a spot Bitcoin ETF, but approve a futures ETF just seems arbitrary and capricious. I, I don't understand it. There doesn't seem to be a good reason for why they would do that. So. I'm hopeful that the um, judge in this case will throw out the the SEC's denial of the grayscale spot Bitcoin ETF. And then finally, we'll have another option for investors to safely hold their money. Mm. And then, of course, just last week, Coinbase got a Wells notice, which is crazy. They've been the, probably the most regulated yeah. institution going public and everything. And uh, they, they made a stance and said they're going to fight as well. Uh, I'm you know, does it make sense? And I've been tweeting about this and so forth, that maybe these crypto companies have to come together, form some sort of coalition and all sue the SEC. I, I, do you think that makes sense? Yeah, it's possible. Uh, I mean, and it's it's fortunate that Coinbase, Ripple, Grayscale, again, they're well capitalized and they can take yeah. on that fight. There are a lot of small players that we'll never hear about that mm -hmm. got that, you know, Wells notice, or they got a subpoena from the SEC, and they folded. Mm -hmm. And that innovation probably went overseas. Um, so the more that we can allocate resources, that everyone can swim the same way and say, hey, we are going to get together and fight the SEC, because what we're seeing um, seems to be just bad policy, um, or seems to be an injustice. I think that's always, you know, the better way to do things. So I saw some tweets um, that Gary Genser apparently is going to be going in front of us in committee uh, soon in April, I believe. And I, I interviewed um, Representative Heisinga, Tom Emmer and so forth, and those who are part of the, the House Financial Committee, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, one of the things they mentioned, they were going to hold him accountable um, that they could potentially control the purse strings and the budget that he can get. Um, and of course, part of this is the enforcement actions, a lack of clarity. They want to hold them accountable. You know, what are you hearing about these upcoming meetings and, and what might happen? Yeah, April 18th, get your popcorn ready. Uh, Gary Gensler will be forced to answer questions from those members you just named on the record. And I think that's the most important part. You know, hold his feet to the fire. Ask him, you know, why he's making these decisions, why we're seeing enforcement actions instead of rulemaking. Um, you know, we don't have a single rule out there from the SEC related to digital assets. I mean, that's crazy at this point in time. And you say you're the primary regulator and that 99 percent of these things are everything but Bitcoin is security and you haven't put out rules to establish that. That, that just seems asinine to me. So. I'm really excited for those hearings because we'll, it will finally get the oversight that this industry has been looking for. Chairman Gensler will finally have to answer questions um, from the industry through those members of Congress. So I, I encourage you, if you're in the industry and you have good relationships with those members, inform them, tell them your story, um, send them some questions to ask, because I know that they are uh, ready and willing to uh, make sure he has to answer them. For sure. I, I, I'm ready for that. I'll definitely have my popcorn ready. There you go. Um, I got some wrap-up questions here for you. Um, if you could create your own metaverse, what would the theme be? Oh, <laughs> well, um, I'm trying to think of my hobby. So I'm a huge presidential history nerd, like mm -hmm. massive, massive. Uh, read, I've read a book on every president. I would create some kind of metaverse where you can go to like the president's house. Like you could meet them, you could interact with them. They would have their own like metaverse president there. Rapid fire questions. Favorite food? Chicken parm. Favorite musician or band? Frank Sinatra. Got to go back to my Jersey roots. <laughs> For sure. Uh, favorite movie? Goodfellas. Also with the, oh. the Frank Sinatra Frank, Frank Sinatra theme. Oh, man. Uh, Goodfellas. Such a great movie. Uh, favorite book? Ooh. Um, I just read recently A Man Called Ove, um, and they just came out with a movie, Tom Hanks, A Man Called Otto, that's based on the book. 
great book. It's a tearjerker. Um, and so maybe some recency bias, but that's one of my favorites. Nice. And I think you mentioned, you know, your hobby. I, I, that was going to be my last question. You know, you, you like reading about uh, the history and presidents and so forth. Yeah, big, you know, presidential history nerd again. I uh, love the presidents. Also a huge sports fan. Uh, so I, I'm watching every sports. I play soccer. Uh, I played in college. And so, yeah, sports sports and presidents are my, my two biggest hobbies. Oh, man. Awesome. Cody, great chatting with you. I appreciate the information. Yeah, awesome. Glad to be here, Tony. Thanks so much for having me. 